Hello, everyone. This is Rong Hui Gu, a computer science professor from Columbia University. In this talk, I will give a brief overview of our Deep Sea project for building certified smart contracts under the support of Columbia IBM Center. Uh, let me first introduce myself. I joined Columbia Computer Science Department in 2018 as an assistant professor. My research is focused on building trustworthy system software through a technique called formal verification, which I will introduce later. I'm the major developer of Certicos, the world's first fully verified multiprocessor OS kernel that is guaranteed to be bug-free and hacker-resistant. My works on verified systems also won me the SSP 19 Best Paper Award and were selected as CACM Research Highlights. In 2019, my colleagues and I initiated this deep sea project, aiming for applying our formal verification techniques to the blockchain domain and building a tool chain for writing truly trustworthy blockchain smart contracts. Columbia IBM Center for Blockchain Data Transparency is the first sponsor of this deep sea project. So why we want to build deep sea and why the blockchain world needs deep sea. We all know that blockchains are exciting technologies because they have the potential to fundamentally rework how we trust each other. Before we have blockchains, many transactions such as exchanging two assets have traditionally required trust in a third party, such as a bank, to faithfully execute the transaction. While well, with blockchains nowadays, everything has been changed. When swapping two digital assets on blockchains, rather than needing to trust a third party service provider, we now only need to trust a smart contract, which is a program running on top of blockchain to correctly encode the transaction logic. Sounds really cool, right? But what if that smart contract is wrong? What if that smart contract has bugs? This has happened many times in the blockchain world, resulting in billions of dollars of financial loss every year. The most famous case is a DAO attack in 2016. Back then, hackers utilized a single re-entry bug in the DAO contract to conduct a double spend attack and stole three, 36 million ethers, which was more than $1 billion nowadays. And this is not a real case. Four years later, just this April, hackers utilized a similar re-entrance bug in the land of me D DeFi, pro uh, DeFi contracts to steal more than $25 million through double span attack. You can see that developers never learn, even after four years, even after this $1 billion was attack, right? So why it is so challenging, right, to avoid such kind of bugs? and why it's so challenging to protect smart contracts. I would say that different from traditional commodity system software, blockchain smart contracts are hard to change once deployed. And besides, most of the code of smart contracts are open sourced. You can imagine that with a huge attack benefits, hackers can carefully read the source code, trying to find loopholes and then perform attacks. While the developers can't make changes after the, the development, uh, after the deployment, even if they notice uh, the attack. So we really need a technique to write bug-free smart contracts at the first place, even before deploying them. So how can we avoid, how can we achieve this and how can we avoid bugs in smart contracts? The right answer is formal verification. As SL4 paper stated that, Complete formal verification is the only knowing way to guarantee that a system is free of programming errors. By formal verification, we mean to use mathematical ways to prove that a program meets its programmer's intention, which we call a specification. And uh, here's an example that we can verify that a smart contract with, with, with respect to its specification which saying that the money one can withdraw from the smart contract must not be more than the amount in his or her balance. So that is a specification and we can use formal verification to prove that the smart contract is correct with respect to this 
specification. And the design of DeepC deeply embraces this formal verification idea. Uh, given input smart contract written in DeepC, uh, we will provide a compiler to compile the source program into its intermediate representation and then all the way down to the bytecode of Hyperledger Fabric EVM. And this compilation paths are proven to be correct, meaning that we verify the source program and the compiled program have the same behavior. Meanwhile, DeepC will generate verification conditions in, in the cog proof of systems, uh, which will enable developers to conduct formal verification in an interactive mode. And thanks to the correctness guarantee of our DeepC compiler, the verified properties of the smart contracts will still hold at the bytecode level. Here I will use the simple uh, smart contracts written in DeepC to show how it works in practice. You can see that, uh, well, this is how we use DeepC compiler to compile the source program written in, smart, uh, written in DeepC uh, to our intermediate representations written in the cog.v files. And then uh, compile this IR code into EVM assembly code, which is also defined in the cog.v files. And at the same, same time, uh, DeepC compiler will also generate verification conditions also in Cockadal V files. And then the developers can do formal verification uh, in Cock interactively as shown here. Okay. Uh, our DeepC also build a, a tactic library uh, to automate a big portion of such, uh, such a proof. So you can see that well, DeepC can, can enable developers to develop not only smart contracts, but also their proofs in the same framework. And also the compiler will make sure that the compilation will not introduce any bugs. Well, we open source the entire DeepC project on September the 4th. And uh, in less than a week, we have already received more than 300 stars on GitHub. Uh, we plan to keep a and maintaining the steep sea community uh, and increase its impacts by targeting more and more blockchain ecosystems. Uh, besides the IBM Hyperledger platform, we are now also working with, uh, let's say, the Ant chain from Ant Financials, the Ethereum platforms, and the Certix chain, which is the first security focused blockchain systems. And we're working with these companies. Uh, on the integration of DeepC to their pl platforms. And more platforms will be launched as well in the near future. And I will say that the DeepC project and all these achievements can't exist without the support from the Columbia IBM Center. And we believe that with all this support, the DeepC project will make a big step towards building trustworthy blockchain ecosystems. And uh, that's, that's all. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Today, I will present our research work, Distributed Error Correction Coding Scheme for Low Storage Blockchain Systems. My name is Chong Li. I'm uh, the co-author of this work. And uh, today, I'm presenting the work on behalf of uh, Professor Xiao Zheng Wang. So, this is a paper uh, we published on IEEE Internet of Things Journal. And this paper was just uh, published in August of 2020. And if you're interested in the details of this research work, uh, please feel free to download the paper online. Um, so what's the problem here we wanna solve? Uh, we know that for a given blockchain network, uh, usually there is a thousands or tens of thousands of nodes in it. Uh, they are e either light node or full node. So the light node is usually stores uh, a partial uh, information of the ledger, uh, while the full node stores the entire ledger. That means all full nodes stores exactly the same thing, the entire ledger. So this is good because um, this, is, uh, um, uh, this is very difficult for the blockchain uh, or the ledger to be tempered by attackers or hackers. So, uh, but on the other hand, this is a huge 
uh, redundancy and therefore it is very inefficient for the whole network. So this is the motivated by this fact, uh, our research uh, has three goals as follows. The first research goal is to reduce the memory require, uh, requirements for the full nodes because we know that the entire ledger size of the entire ledger is increasing day by day. Okay, and it goes to unlimited and the, the increasing speed is really, really fast. So we have to reduce the memory requirements. Otherwise, in the near future, there's almost no uh, computers or servers can be the food, can serve as a food node in the blockchain network. So the second goal is to construct a network with only light nodes with uh, small memory requirements. And the last goal is to reduce the network load in terms of uh, the amount of data transmitted between the nodes. Let me dive into more details about our solution. So our solution, the basic idea of our solution to reduce the storage of a full node is, we, is that we leverage, we use the RDPC code in coding theory to uh, encode the group of blockchain symbols and such that each node in the network only need to store uh, uh, one vector of the coded words uh, rather than the entire uh, blocks. So for example, uh, we, have, we have a blocks one, blocks two, up to blocks MT in this figure. And so we group block one to block T as a group of one, and we're doing the similar things. So we, we can have a group two, group three, up to group M. And then for each group, uh, we use RDPC code. Uh, it's a systematic RDPC code to encode a group of uh, blockchain symbols, and we will get a code words. And then for a group uh, GM, each node will only store a, a, a vector of the code words uh, rather than the whole group of blocks. So by doing so, basically, we obtain a T for the reduction of node storage requirements. Then how to decode the, uh, the, the entire group of GM? So the following is the decoding algorithm. So decoding is a pretty standard LDPC decoding. So basically, um, the node, if the node want to decode the entire group, uh, the node will ask for the information from its neighbors because all these neighbors, uh, each of the neighbors has installed a vector of the coded words. And if the neighbor is not active, and uh, the node will, uh, will uh, uh, the corresponding uh, vector will be replaced by erasure X. So at the end of the day, the node uh, who wanna decode the entire group of blocks we got a vector, uh, a matrix in such a form where you got a bunch of X, which means that these informations, uh, information are missing. So, and then the node just decode each row of this matrix using an eraser decoding of the LDPC code. And the complexity of this algorithm is n log n. Uh, well, you may want to ask, okay, now let's say a node want to verify each transaction, okay? Uh, but the, by doing so, the node just need to recover one individual block rather than entire of a blocks or the entire group of the blocks. Okay, so is there an algorithm that uh, ask uh, let the node just just recover one individual block? Uh, the answer is yes. In this paper, we also present a algorithm uh, for the node to uh, just uh, recover an individual block. And uh, the basic idea here is uh, like we uh, leverage the, uh, it's a modified version of a belief of propagation algorithm. Okay, um, so here we have a lemma. Uh, it's a mathematical result to show that uh, given the probability that a neighboring node uh, is in, uh, inactive, then what's the probability that we have to contact uh, more than n nodes to successfully uh, recover an individual block? Okay, and here on this slide, I we show some uh, uh, numbers, simulation numbers, to give you a sense that how the theory results, theoretical results works. So assume if you look at this pair of numbers, this row, and uh, uh, so assume we have one percent of nodes in the network or inactive. Okay, so then the expected number uh, uh, to reach out 
in order to successfully recover one individual block is 1.09. It's a little bit more than uh, one. So this is, this is not, that, that means our algorithm is a very, very efficient. Okay, so then the next question you may want to ask, okay, by leveraging this RTPC code in coding theory, uh, seems like we don't need a full node. We only need the light node, right? So the answer is yes. We can modify the protocol, blockchain protocol, a little bit, a little bit, such that we only have light nodes. So the basic idea is the following. So we would like to modify the mining algorithm so that to reduce the network load. And also we wanted to simplify the verification procedure uh, because checking back all transactions of a node require decoding of too many blocks, which is too high complexity for a light node. Uh, then um, what's the basic idea of the mod, uh, to modify the mining algorithm and also the verification procedure? So this is the, so this is the story. Uh, we the, after uh, after the uh, the miner successfully mined a block, the the new block will be broadcasted to only a randomly selected node rather than all the nodes in the network. Okay, and then um, these uh, AM verifiers we call this an AM randomly selected nodes as verifiers. And these M verifiers, they follow a Bison High fault tolerance algorithm uh, to verify the block. And once this block is verified by this uh, type of uh, BFT uh, algorithm, and then this uh, information will be broadcasted to all the nodes. Okay, and also here we have a theoretical results to show that how to find the smallest uh, sufficient number M of the verifiers, okay. Um, here is uh, some simulation results to show that by using all the light nodes as, uh, on top of, uh, with, along with the RTPC code, uh, how much we can save. So if you look at these numbers, this is average storage reduction. reduction. So you see that uh, basically this uh, reduction, storage reduction is very significant. Okay. Well, so far, this is the other work presented in the paper. And so now what we're currently working on is the, this topic. We call it uh, uh, motivated by the fact that in real life network, nodes typically are, uh, are actively living and joining the network. So if this is the case and we are still wanna use RDPC code, then we're gonna have, we're gonna be in trouble because uh, we need to be sure, uh, we need to know that how to produce the new parity symbols for all previous generated groups without decoding all the previous code, code vectors. And also we have many other open problems as well. So, but how to resolve this, this problem, our approach is to, we want to use a systematic rate list codes, including the function codes and the raptor code. And this is the ongoing research work, and we are pretty sure that we're going to have the new results in the near future. Um, that's all the, uh, uh, this is a very quick summary about what we have done and we, what are we going to do for the next step. So if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out to us. Uh, thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Tal Malkin. I'm a professor in the computer science department. I'm also at the Data Science Institute Cybersecurity Center. And I'm also affiliated with the IBM Columbia Center for Blockchain and Data Transparency. I wanted to thank the IBM Columbia Center for funding my research. And the topic is cryptographic tools for secure sharing and learning in the wake of COVID-19. Okay. So um, my work is on cryptographic tools for secure sharing and um, learning. This includes secure computation, privacy preserving machine learning, and differential privacy. I will um, touch in this talk um, on some of these things. Um, and our goal is to use those cryptographic tools to tailor them specifically uh, with uh, pandemic fighting applications in mind, and in particular, uh, we'll talk about, or we'll aim to uh, facilitate, first of all, uh, data collection, sharing, and analysis for health and uh, public safety data. This includes data from uh, users, from your cell phone, 
uh, from hospitals and clinics, uh, data to um, understand spreading patterns, symptoms, treatment effectiveness, etc. So basically sharing of data privately and securely, uh, as well as contact tracing, making it both more secure and more accurate and informative. Um, and I will uh, talk a little bit more about that. Um, on the cryptographic technical side, the main uh, trade-offs we will study are uh, efficiency of runtime, communication, latency, um, notions of security, what uh, attacks can we protect against, and accuracy. Um, on the application side, we will try to balance these two things where more information, more statistics um, is very good and in fact crucial to understand uh, the pandemic, how uh, infection spreads, what treatment works, uh, and to find and isolate carriers, but it also very bad and dangerous uh, for civil liberties and privacy. I'll talk a little bit more about potential attacks. So we don't want to have, uh, having a lot of information around um, is dangerous as well. So we want to balance um, these two things. So um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of these points here and discuss uh, what research we're planning to do. Some of this research is already underway uh, and some of it in different stages of work. All right, so let me start with discussing contact tracing, how it's done now. Uh, there have been many recent efforts all over the world, um, including an effort by Apple and Google for contact tracing, uh, where your personal device and the Bluetooth communicates with other devices nearby uh, in order to figure out if you've been near somebody who was infected. There are many suggestions, but I'll describe the approach in a very high level that is basically the same high level for all of them. Um, so your mobile device, every mobile device continuously broadcasts a random pseudonym, a pseudorandom string that is dynamic and changing and random is not um, connected to your identity, you keep broadcasting it wherever you go, uh, some random pseudonym. And at the same time, you keep uh, collecting pseudonyms that are broadcast near you of other devices that are in proximity to you, and you collect them. Now, when someone tests positive, uh, their, all their pseudonyms and their seed are uploaded to a public server. Everybody can um, regularly go to the public server, look at all the pseudonyms that were published, uh, for potential uh, infection or po testing positive and compare them against the pseudonyms that my device was nearby uh, recently. And if there's an intersection, then I put myself in quarantine or go testing, etc. Note that the way it's done, no location information is used. My actual GPS location information is never used. And moreover, there's no collection of data or statistics of any kind. And both of these things are in order to maintain privacy. So this is how contact tracing, the current ongoing efforts are. Um, and some problems with this are, first of all, that we miss out on collecting data. As I said before, there's a lot of uh, useful information that could be collected and statistics that healthcare providers would like. Uh, and on the other hand, there's also a replay attack that is um, quite dangerous that could be used. So if you wanna target a specific uh, person to uh, convince them that they might have been affected and therefore should go in quarantine, here is what you could do. You could first find some pseudonyms that correspond to a positive testing a person. This could be done, I guess you could go and infect yourself, but it could also be done by going, for example, to hang out near clinics or somewhere else where you think it's likely that there are positive testing pseudonyms, collecting all the transmitted pseudonyms. And then now that you have some pseudonyms that uh, might be positive testing or likely to be positive testing, you can go near specific people you want to target and broadcast those pseudonyms next to them. What happens is those other devices will pick it up and then when they check on the public server, they see that they were near some pseudonyms that are infected and therefore would go and quarantine themselves. Okay, so this attack allows you to um, target a specific person and convince them they were near a bad infected uh, individual by simply broadcasting bad pseudonyms next to them. So for example, imagine this could be used for voter suppression. If I wanna vote specific population, if I wanna suppress specific population, I don't want them to go vote, I can go to them on voter day 
I can go to them on voter day and try to convince them that they're quarantined and uh, apply this replay attack on them. Okay, so this is very bad. Both of these attacks that I described could be mit mitigated by using location information. So if I actually did use my GPS information, for example, um, when I broadcast pseudonyms, they must be connected to the location information. Then I would not be able to uh, then again replay attack because I'm no longer in that location. Uh, okay, and similarly, information and statistics could use your location information. So all this could be mitigated by using location information combined with cryptographic tools, such as key agreement, secure computation, there are other tools as well, that will allow you to, in fact, use this information without um, breaking privacy. Okay, so this is where secure computation comes in. Uh, how can you use, in fact, my location information without anybody knowing what it was? Just use it as part of my computation. So let me say a few general words about secure computation. Um, the goal is to perform some collaborative joint task between different parties on their distributed data, but not leaking anything other than the final result. Okay, so uh, slightly more formally, if I have n parties, p1 to pn, it could be two parties or more, any number of parties, p1 to pn, each party has secret input xi, and together they all want to compute some function f of x1 to xn. This could be some average or some statistics or any functionality really. The point is they do not want to reveal any information about the individual input. So for example, even if the inputs are their location, they only want to compute the output f of x1 to xn without revealing any information about the inputs. Um, and so what they want to do, this, let's say in this example, I have five parties, they all can communicate with each other, can all send messages back and forth. And at the end, they will know f of x1 to xn, but will not compromise any of their secret inputs. So this is secure computation. It's been introduced in the late 80s and it's been a very active area of research for many decades. Um, and it's still ongoing, very active area of research. The upshot is that in principle, this is possible to do for any task. Anything that you could do without security, you could also do securely without leaking information. However, this is only in principle uh, and sometimes the uh, performance is prohibitive and it's not practical. However, it can be efficient and practical for some tasks and lots of uh, recent and current work is trying to make it more possible, practical and efficient and usable for specific tasks and optimizing it. Okay, so this is secure computation in general um, and could be applied to specific computations related to, um, you know, this application at hand. We are also working on a newer kind of secure computation called topology hiding secure computation. So in classic secure computation, which I just discussed in the previous slide, assumes that, any, that there's a point-to-point -point network with a complete graph where any two parties can always talk to each other. That's uh, what is assumed as the underlying communication graph. However, a new direction of topology hiding computation deals with a case where the network graph is not complete. So some uh, edges exist and some edges don't exist. I'm connected to some people, but not to others. And moreover, not only is it not complete, it is also sensitive information. The topology itself, what the graph is, should be kept private. So each party knows who their neighbors are. Maybe they know how many people are, how many nodes are in the whole graph, but they should not know any more information about the topology of the graph. Okay, so examples where this is relevant include social networks, vehicle to vehicle communication, ad hoc sensor network, you know, other Internet of Things network, um, mobile devices, and location based networks which is um, where there's relevance to contract tracing, where I could use my location uh, my, uh, of my mobile device as a node. Um, and in all of these cases, we do not want to reveal the entire topology of the whole network. If this is sensitive information. So the goal in topology hiding computation is like secure computation, each party has secret uh, input x1 to xn. They want to compute the function. Uh, but they want to reveal no information, neither about the inputs as before, but also no other information about the topology beyond what I already knew and what follows from the output. This is a new area with lots of fundamental new ideas and questions that we're working on and others are working on. There are questions about what even is possible to do and what is not, what assumptions are necessary, what uh, power of attack, what adversaries can we tolerate, etc. Okay, so this is, I'm going back to my one slide summary of all the topics. I said something, I touched a little bit upon the secure computation and the applications. Um, let me say just a couple of words um, on the things that I did not 
have time to talk about. One is we would like to work on privacy preserving machine learning. We are working on already. Um, in particular, um, one example is, so you could think of uh, privacy preserving machine learning, you can think of it as possibly a special case of secure computation, but really tailored to machine learning. So um, where we wanna apply machine learning without revealing our inputs. So for example, in secure inference, there's one party holding a model uh, and one party hold, uh, holding an example. Let's say one party holding a neural network that they train and one party holding an example and they wanna know whether the output would be a yes or a no but they do not want to reveal neither the input example nor the model. So they want to do this is secure inference. You could also talk about private training, how to build a model with privacy. Finally, um, everything I talked about so far on the crypto side was about how, how do we compute our desired function securely without leaking any information. We would like to also combine it with differential privacy, which is more of the what, what functions would we be willing to compute? What statistics are safe to release and do not compromise um, the information of the party? Okay, so this is a very high level overview of uh, the ideas that I'm working on. Um, I wanna thank again, the IBM Center for supporting my work and uh, thank you all for your attention. Hello everyone. Today, I will briefly introduce the blockchain course offered by the Department of Electrical Engineering at Columbia. So in fact, blockchain is a distributed ledger technology that disrupts many industries. According to Chaktika, the blockchain market is expected to grow from 5.5 billion in 2019 by, uh, to 20 billion by 2025. The market in Asia and the North America take more than 70%. So this trend is so obvious, so that a blockchain course is very necessary for students who want to learn this technology in a systematic way. So the objective of this course is to provide students with the required knowledge to conduct the research on blockchain and basic skills to design smart contracts and implement distributed applications. So the topic covered in this course includes uh, basic cryptography, such as digital signature, hash functions, and et cetera. And also the topics covers the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, Ethereum blockchain, and some of the vast blockchain technologies, such as directed acyclic graph based blockchains. So in the last part of this course, we walk through uh, the blockchain ecosystem and applications, such as ICO, crypto regulations, and applications to finance, IoT, AI, and the vehicular network. So the series of lectures will teach you all blockchain series, and there are also five lab sessions to provide students with hands-on experience on developing smart contracts on blockchain networks, such as the Ethereum and Hyperledger Fabric. So this course has been offered for two years. We are highly appreciating that so many students gave us positive feedbacks. After taking this course, some students chose blockchain as their PhD research topics. For example, a blockchain footnote needs to store the whole history of a blockchain. The size of a Bitcoin network has experienced consistently high levels of growth since its creation. Now, its size reaches approximately 285 gigabytes as of the end of June 2020. So how to deal with this storage issue is very challenging in general. One of the students, to a certain extent, solved this storage issue by using the coding techniques in communication theory. So the results were published in a very top research journal. So some students have launched their own uh, blockchain startups, uh, such as TensorPlace, which is a blockchain-based transparent uh, marketplace and uh, platform for machine learning and the data science uh, capabilities in GitHub. So by offering this course, we hope that our students will be more knowledgeable and qualified than others in terms of understanding the understanding of a blockchain technology and the ability to help themselves and others navigate the rise of a blockchain in their domain.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tejaswini, founder at Second Trace, a digital solution for waste traceability. I'm thrilled to be here today to share with you all our journey through the Columbia IBM Blockchain Accelerator Program. First of all, uh, thank you, Jack and Demetrio, for giving me the opportunity to share our experience and more about the project. To quickly introduce myself, I graduated from Columbia with a Master's in Sustainability Management, a program that is co-offered by the School of Professional Studies and the Earth Institute. Uh, the goal to study the program was to really understand how data and technology can be leveraged to accelerate the transition to circularity or uh, the circular economy. Uh, just for some context, according to the Ellen Mick Arthur Foundation, the three underlying principles that also define a circular economy and differentiate it from a linear economy are the focus on uh, designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use, and regenerating natural systems. It was last summer that I took the blockchain course at uh, Columbia's Business School, which exposed me to the application of the technology for supply chain transparency, which I thought was fitting for the waste management space, which is rife with middlemen, uh, data manipulation, and the lack of transparency and accountability. Uh, to test the concept, I participated in a hackathon at the NYC Blockchain Center last year, which focused on uh, the use of blockchain technology to scale impact for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We won the hackathon, after which I decided to take the project forward and participate in the Columbia IBM Blockchain Accelerator Program. Through the program, I was uh, fortunate to have worked with this diverse set of individuals, a team of uh, very driven and supportive Columbia grads uh, with backgrounds ranging from data science, statistics, operations research, and environmental studies. To better understand the gap that we are addressing at Second Trace, let's look at the spray bottle. The brand claims to have used 100% recycled plastic to manufacture the bottle. As a consumer, are you questioning its authenticity? If you are, you're not alone. And it's not only you as a consumer that doesn't really know if it really contains 100% recycled plastic, but even corporate brands themselves need to be careful that, they, that, they're buying, that what they're buying is genuinely post-consumer content. With consumer goods firms like Nestle, Unilever, and Coca-Cola making major sustainability commitments to boost the volume of recycled uh, plastic they use, the demand for authentic and high-quality recycled material is growing rapidly. That's about the demand side. Let's look at what's happening on the supply side. Manufacturers or suppliers often provide a guarantee for the recycled plastic they supply, but without but this is often without third-party verification to prove that the material is as claimed. The, the three areas that we're really focusing on are the quality of material, the authenticity of claims, and the consistency in supply of required volumes of recycled material to meet that demand. The approach that we are taking at Second Trace is to track waste through the waste value chain to make it easy for brands and suppliers to source a consistent supply of high quality recycled material from responsible supply chains. It is a tool to prove the source and type of material. How are we doing this? We create material passports for waste to document its content and source, which also helps determine how the waste can be recycled or reused. Uh, the platform uh, also documents chain of custody traceability, that is from the point of collection to the point of recovery and manufacturing. Consumers can now vote with their dollars and purchase sustainable packaging that support livelihoods while also reducing environmental damage. And similarly, brands will now have a perfect alternative to virgin material. They can source quality ingredients from producers across the world and enrich economically vulnerable communities. These are screenshots of a few news pieces that I came across uh, recently that support our business case. 
Everledger recently released a report on why traceability matters in recycling and the circular economy. And Alphabet is now issuing sustainability bonds to support environmental and social initiatives. For anyone in the audience that's interested in learning more, I'd be happy to send over the links. At the moment, we're developing the product and building out our team. And uh, the project also recently got selected to participate in the Circular, Circular Innovation Jam, uh, which was organized by the Incubation Network at Second News. Uh, the journey so far has definitely come with the inevitable twists and turns, um, pivots and reality checks. Uh, but we've definitely come a long way from where we started. And to wrap up, I'd like to highlight a few um, aspects and sessions of the program that particularly added value for our project and helped us uh, leapfrog from a pretty crude uh, concept to something tangible. Uh, number one is the very passionate core team, the core organizing team, uh, Jules, Chuck, and uh, Demetro, who have worked uh, very hard to put together the program and at times also believed in us more than we did ourselves. Uh, two is the network of mentors who have been extremely invested in our success and take genuine interest in um, in the project, irrespective of uh, their areas of expertise and background. And uh, though all program sessions were meticulously designed and organized, uh, power packed with great content and guests. Uh, speakers. A program session that stood out for me uh, was blockchain intensive session at IBM's offices uh, driven by Jim Tomonto with the cowboy hat uh, as you can see in the image on top. Uh, he walked us through the evolution of the internet from web 1.0 to 4.0 and um, hosted a few activities that brought up very vividly the true value of the technology. It, and it was during this session that uh, we realized the solution was better suited for the emerging market, uh, where not only most of the world's waste is being dumped, uh, but also because of the existence of the informal waste economy in which workers are often unbanked and underpaid. Looping in the social arm of sustainability also added another impact area for our work. Um, overall, the um, accelerator programs uh, focus on customer interviews, market research, and lean methodologies have played a key role in the development of our project. Uh, and for someone like me with um, little uh, knowledge about a little background in um, finance and business. It was a great launch pad um, and also offered invaluable insights into the world of startups, capital markets, and business. Um, I'm certainly grateful for all the people um, that have come along with the program and I'm looking forward to staying connected.